Marsha McLuhan. Mm -hmm. In Italy. Okay, so good to see you, get you here. Thank you, you're looking good. And the book is magnificent, and I thank you for coming in. It's a great pleasure. And in the audience, welcome very much to Conversations. Pleasure to welcome to the set. Um, uh, Jack McLean, he's the author of a really very, very interesting, beautifully written, if I may say so, right at the outside, book called Loon, A Marine Story. It happens to be a one of the national bestsellers that have uh, been out in the shop, uh, out in the in the stores, and so forth. And Jack, welcome so much, very much to conversation. Well, thank you, great Harold. pleasure. It's, it's great to be here. Thank you. It's my pleasure to welcome you on this wintry day. And I wonder if maybe you could, uh, maybe you could set the tone. The book is so well written. It's it's engrossing. It's very hard to put down, and it's a story of your own life. So that might be a good thing for us to wade into. Your life. You were born into a an unusual situation and had an unusual situation by which you came to be in the Marine Corps, uh, Loon, a Marine story. But could you share your own background? Born and raised, a little of your education, family, that sort of thing, and then your time in the Marines. And we'll talk about all of that okay. uh, from the standpoint of what's in the well, book. Well, Loon, Loon is a memoir, mm -hmm. um, as, as you note, about uh, my time in the Marine Corps in the years 1966 to 1968. Right. Uh, and 1966 was when I graduated from uh, Phillips Academy in Andover, uh, Massachusetts. In 1968, uh, several weeks after I got out, I became the first uh, um, Vietnam veteran to matric matriculate to Harvard University. Okay, it's a big jump. Share Philip Andover for some of the people. That's a major prep school. Uh, it's a prep school. I started in um, uh, there in, as a freshman in September <clears throat> uh, 1962, the same day that uh, uh, former President George W. Bush started. <laughs> um, and we spent the following three years. He was years. a classmate? No, he was a year ahead. And then a year? I took an extra year, so he, w and we, I, he graduated two years ahead. Oh, I see. So you were in But we spent three years together. Mm -hmm. uh, and did you and, know him at all? Or? Well, I knew him. I, mm. Why not? We didn't, we, didn't, we didn't hang out. How many are there? There's four or five hundred people, students? At 800, a, 800 then. 800 yeah. now. More, and, no, 800 then, more now. More now. But I started you know, to, to go back. My, my background up to Andover was... Uh, that I was born in Summit, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. uh, my father worked in uh, New York mm -hmm. uh, and you know, took the train in every day. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a very normal 50s childhood. I had a paper route delivering the Newark Evening News. Okay. I, uh, you do it on a bicycle? I did it on a bicycle. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I had a, um, learned to swim at the YMCA. Right. I, Mm -hmm. uh, went to the Brayton Elementary School and mm -hmm. Summit Junior High School. Had lots of friends. I was a very agreeable child. I liked everybody, and everybody seemed to like me. Very so good. Was, family setting was warm and friendly and yeah, so nice, forth. Yeah, very and, uh, nice family with... Um, uh, Dr. Spock? Would have been, you were raised as a oh, yeah, Dr. We were, Spock baby? Oh, uh, well, we were all certainly Dr. Spock babies. Very that, permissive in that, that sort that, of thing, that, yeah. Well, I'm not sure my parents would agree with that. Oh, okay, yeah. Right. But an older, a brother was six years older, a sister three years older, and, mm -hmm. a, um, and a little sister who uh, you get to know better in the book, who mm -hmm. was six years younger, mm -hmm. who was certainly very much impacted by... Uh, by my going to Vietnam, everybody was. But, yeah, because uh, it was so surprising to have somebody, I think it's worth underscoring that Philip Andover is one of the, if not the, I'm not sure how they judge, they have, they have Eaton and Harrow in, in England to deal with the class, you know, but one of the major uh, preparatory schools, generally from the people of the families of the elite of the society. Well, it was, I mean, it certainly was that way in the, um, uh, Many many years ago, it's not it's not that way any longer. It is not. The society has changed. We don't have the prep school thing going now. Still? No, I, no. I think it's. I, I think you probably still have a, uh, um, in, in, you know, an abundance of, of kids that come from privileged backgrounds. Yeah. Uh, but um, with a school like one of the things that makes a school like Andover unique is that it is so heavily endowed uh, that it can uh, admit students almost on a as needed basis, almost on a on a need need blind basis. So would that would that be uh, okay? You, you said a whole number of things there. Then you, you people you know come from the elite sections of society and so forth, and then uh, academically they could set standards and so forth. But you're coming from people who your family was in a position of uh, leadership in terms of the overall society. 
politically or economically? Well, not politically. My, I mean, my father was worked in nonprofits most of his life. Uh -huh. and, um, he uh, uh, and my mother was um, was very active in uh, community affairs. Right. My uh, my grandfather was a, a former six-term congressman from uh, Union Union County, New Jersey. Okay, uh -huh. um, who started in. Um, uh, went to went to Washington at age 12 to be a uh, a page in the Senate a page, yeah, because right. his parents uh, wanted to f find a way to get him educated. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, so it was a and the page school at the time was mm -hmm. a was a good place to do that. Yeah. When I was in coming on ninth grade, yeah. um, my father decided I would go to. Philip. Andover, go had away, he gone go to Andover? School. He had gone to Andover. See, it's a tradition. Yeah, okay, yeah. right, and, right. Um, the, uh, uh, my grandfather, his father had gone to the Page School okay. um, in, in, yeah. in the Senate. Yeah. Uh, so I went to Andover. I arrived uh, not nearly as prepared as I, uh, as I might have been. I struggled um, very badly for five years, although <laughs> it's, it's a, a long time. It's a four-year school. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Although I liked it, and I uh, I liked the teachers, I liked my classmates. Yeah. Uh, uh, it was, uh, uh, but for the academics, which were very rigorous, on had uh, trouble with trigonometry right up to the end. If I'm uh, not right to the end, that was the, <laughs> the final thing. And yeah. I, um, uh, I found out the day before graduation that I wasn't going to graduate that, uh -huh. uh, because I because had not passed trig trigonometry. Mm -hmm. uh, but I took him. But prior to that, in March of my senior year, mm -hmm. uh, when I was home on on uh, vacation, mm -hmm. the, uh, I got my last turn down letter from a college. I'd applied right. to five colleges. Right, that was fine. And, uh, and I, Andover could have gotten me in somewhere. I would uh, have thought, yeah, yeah. But I decided that I'd sort of played the game and I was really exhausted academically. I didn't really want to, I, I just didn't, I, I wanted to. The day to, that fifth letter came, there was one college, was it City University or something? No, it was uh, actually Colby College. Colby and, College, you were probably, that was the they, last one. Ford refused to have you as a yeah. student coming into the university. They were the last one. And then one. That, that was the day of some uh, chagrin or upset or something when that letter came, but it was a turning point. No, it was actually, yeah, it was actually a turning point and I, I um, I was home in mm. then Brookline, Massachusetts, where my family was then living, and mm. uh, and th thought that I uh, I really didn't want to go to college anyway. I thought I'd given it a good, honest try. Uh, I was also in danger of flunking several courses, which ultimately I did. One, uh, uh -huh. um, and it was 1966. It was March wow. of 1966. Uh -huh. There was a draft. Yes, still. That's right. Uh, so you had two choices. It was still from Korea, right? Well, in yeah. before, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. you could go to um, college and get mm -hmm. a deferment, mm -hmm. or you could um, go into the military. Yeah. So I thought that uh, most people from Andover probably would have some sort of a deferment. Everybody. Yeah, everybody virtually. Yeah, yeah right. That and would be the yeah. They'd go. Out, everybody go to college. Most. Mm. Um, sure. Uh, most anybody that could get a deferment in 1966 uh -huh. uh, or afterwards got one. By, right. Right. And. If you couldn't get a deferment, you were like, um, say, George W. Bush. You you went into the Texas Air National Guard, or, and which was an easy ticket to never go to Vietnam. Right. The National Guard didn't go to Vietnam. Sixty-six to Vietnam was heating up. We'd been there. I don't know. It wasn't. We'd really been there. The Marine Corps had been there at that point for a year. Had and taken over from the French who had been there. Well, after the, Dien Bien Phu. the French had had, had left yeah. uh, after Dien Bien Phu, which yeah. was considerably earlier. Mm. Fifty-four, um, I think. Yeah. 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 But this was. Um, Vietnam, as I as I say in the book, it, in, in March of 1966, was still a country and not a war. Yeah, right. So, for people, as you went in, as I went in, okay. So, for yeah. people that whose experience I'd look at, right. um, that might be my brother's age, say yeah. six years older than yeah. I, um, or of, pardon the expression, your generation, yeah, you know, yeah, in no, the, right. in, the, yeah. in the 50s yeah. would. Uh, would go in and they'd serve for two years. They'd get drafted or they'd enlist. Maybe yeah. they'd go to Germany or Japan. Yeah, um, you'd go may, to guest houses. Maybe they'd go on um, guard duty someplace. Maybe might, they'd go on a ship for a, a year or two. Like a, like a cruise. And that would be that. Yeah, right. Uh, and they'd come back. And uh, so I thought, well, I could, you know, I'll go to... Germany, or I'll go to Korea. Or was it a big decision to go into the military? You made that decision after well, that. Well, it was not a. It, you wrote about it very poignantly. It it was, and, mm -hmm. and um, 
but it talks was, with your mother? Well, yes. I'm not sure I, I talked with my mother. My, Will you talk about at that time? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, my mother, uh, my mother talked to me, <laughs> a bit. and um, and I responded. And I think what was clear to me yeah. was that I um, I was either going to go to college or I was going to go in the military. Okay. And I wasn't going to try to get out of the military. If mm. they saw that I wasn't fit, that would be one thing. So mm. yeah, that's I, um, um, uh, so I went down to, and I decided I was going to do it for two years. Mm -hmm. There's as much time as I wanted to take. You off. were able to do it for two years uh, only? Yeah, as it turned out. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And so I went to the Army, and it was, uh, you could volunteer for the draft, and it would be two years, but yeah. you may not get drafted for a year, so it would effectively yeah. be three years. The yeah. Navy was four years. The Air Force was four years. Even then, you couldn't get near the Coast Guard or the National Guard, or because anybody who had any influence was was Going getting into the in, Navy. No, getting into the Coast Guard or the or reserves or National Guard, all the sort of easy. That was to avoid duty. All the easy ways to yeah. to, to, okay. to yeah. sort of get in it, but get get out of it. Yeah. Uh, and then I went and visited the last place I visited in, uh, in the old Customs House in Boston was yeah. the uh, was the Marine Corps office. Mm. And, they Marine said, Corps. "We got a deal for you. Yeah, um, we'll make a Marine out of you. We uh, we have a we have a new two year program. Uh -huh. You can enlist right now, mm -hmm. and then go in after you graduate, and uh -huh. then get out two years later." And uh -huh. I said, "Well, gee, that's perfect. You know, I'll yeah. go in and." In June or July, then I'll get out in June or July. Two go years to later, college, go to college, yeah, and, yeah. and I'll have two years, and I'll have an experience. And you would pick up the GI Bill then too, and also get the GI Bill, which right. uh, I used to uh, pay for college. Yeah, that was a major thing that uh, helped this country. Yeah, but sure anyway, was. go ahead. Yeah, and and um, uh, so I uh, I did much to the shock of my everybody, my family, I would think. Uh, people at Andover. You've done what? Yeah. <laughs> 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 And um, and I I just to me it just seemed obvious you know I well, was brought up uh, in a I hate to use the word but in a you know in a patriotic environment we used to mm -hmm. uh, adore people like Audie Murphy or yes. the heroes of World War II right. we played he played did. war and played guns and sure. did all the yeah. things that that kids back at that time did uh, but it was also uh, there was no question in March of '66 that. Uh, it was still uh, an honor to serve one's country. And the, the, the ant, what was ahead in terms of the social well, changed, fabric was still in the future. It, yeah, it yeah. changed dramatically. Yeah, I mean, right. From the time that I enlisted in March until the time I graduated in late June, uh, it really was heating up. Right. And by the time I went in in early August, uh -huh. um, it was really hot. By the time I graduated... August of 66. 66 it was starting to get really hot. It was, it was just, it was going up. Had they, had the, Abby Hoffman and those guys tried to levitate the Pentagon yet? No, that was no, all. That, that was 67. That, that was all coming. That was coming, yeah, okay, yeah. So they, they uh, in, in um, uh, I went into boot camp in early August, Paris Island, South Carolina. Paris Island, it sounds like Devil's Island and it was, to me. Well, it was, <laughs> it was worse. <laughs> worse than Devil's Island. Uh, yeah. It was very rigorous. For, I, knew. I had a friend who went through, me. he said it was hell on earth. Yeah. It was, uh, but it was, um, they sure whipped you into shape. And I graduated in November. And when the last day of your- From um, Andover. No, from Paris Island. I graduated from Andover in Wait, June. Wait, a lot happened to you at and and before you graduated at pa Paris Island. Pa pa well, I went to Paris Island in October. Yeah, but I, I mean, mean a lot August. happened to you as a young man at Paris Island that might be worthy of talking some about. Uh, well, would, let's jump right to the graduation because you had a sergeant you ran into there. Well, I didn't run into him. He, well, he, he ran into he you ran rather. Into me. Yeah, yeah, I, but, I wasn't in the. Yeah, but it was very illustrative of uh, uh, you know the military. In a sense, and you were geared toward the military. Did you have any political thinking about Vietnam no, or had anything? No, you hadn't done that. I had no political thinking. I had nobody in my my family. And you were a nice guy. Everybody liked you. You yeah. were a nice guy. You got along with everybody. You always do, right? Yeah. And everything. So still like that. <laughs> yeah, still are. You know, but, but you know. I, I was the only, uh, and this was true for the whole time I was in and beyond. Uh, I was just about the only person that my family or anybody that my family knew mm -hmm. that was in Vietnam. So yeah. none of my, my, my family didn't know anybody, my siblings didn't know anybody, my 
my family's friends, right. their friends. Nobody knew anybody who was either in the service or in Vietnam. That sort it of was, thing was for the people that were of a different class. It was so rare. So rare in your in, circles. In, um, for anybody that, and so when I, um, uh, you know, that being the case, when I, when I've, one thing I, I, I did when I first got to Paris Island was mm. made sure that I kept a journal in the form of that's right in the yeah. form of letters home. Mm -hmm. And so that's a good general thing for life. When actually. it came time to uh, write the book, uh, which I started writing in about 2001, mm -hmm. uh, I had 110 letters that I'd written home from right. the time that I arrived at Paris Island until the flight home from Vietnam yeah. two, two years later. Right, yeah, great, great um, research, yeah, great research, research, yeah. But when I, on graduation day, okay. uh, day before graduation at Paris Island in November 66, just showing how things escalated, yeah. uh, the, um, I'd say fully half or better of our graduating platoon of 100 kids mm. got orders to go infantry to Vietnam. They sent you to some other thing. And they sent me to supply school, which is right. sort of what I figured would happen. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I went to Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, and I studied supply and learned how to type. And mm -hmm. they sent me out to a, a big supply center out in Barstow, California in the mm -hmm. desert. And mm -hmm. I did that for about six months. And now it's the, um, it's July of 1967. You would have been a private. In the Marine Corps, I was a. By then, I was a PFC. Actually. Oh, PFC! You made PFC. Made Congratulations! PFC. Well, yeah, it took me two years <laughs> to get my PFC stripe. For I don't want to go into my thing, but anyway, that's good. But the, were you gung ho? I was. What as, they would call gung ho, or no, were you I looking was, at it askance? Were you seeing it like a Kafkaesque movie, or what was your attitude? No, I was. I, I think that I, uh, I'd, I'd taken a deep breath and jumped in, and and I would take whatever they they gave me. Yeah, and, and they gave you a lot. And they gave me uh, a lot of. I mean, boot camp was very difficult, but working in a supply warehouse in. California desert wasn't difficult. Was it air conditioned? Uh, it was air conditioned. Okay, good. I'm glad to hear. We live in Little Quonset. Right, 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 right. Uh, right. And uh, I went home for my annual leave in July, and now it's July 1967. Things oh. have really heated up. July 67. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah that's so beginning to be. So when I came back after big demonstration 67 on both coasts. Everything. Really, yeah. And. When I came back <coughs> to Barstow in uh, late July 1967, mm. um, they had eliminated all of our jobs for those of us that were sort of in my class, yeah. um, replaced us with women Marines, Okay, because um, mm. what we were doing was mainly clerical, Getting ready. changed our orders to, as they say in the Marine Corps, 0311, which is infantry, right. combat infantry. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's an MOS. Is yes, it's yeah. our, our MOS, mm -hmm. and sent us down to Camp Pendleton, which is the big West Coast training California. center for the Marines, mm -hmm. uh, to retrain in the infantry, and then several weeks later, sent us all to Vietnam. Okay, right, yeah. And everything. so I joined. I went from being in a supply warehouse yeah, right. to uh, being um, at a wonderful thing. I had a. Uh, um, a flying, we flew over on commercial aircraft. You did, okay. and not mass. They used to have something mats or no, something. No, that, but we flew up like, okay, like Pan okay, Am. Okay, so you yeah. had flight attendants and yeah. you had everything, mm. and they had magazines. Would you like a magazine? Mm, so I, yeah. I'm looking at a Life magazine right. from the fall, late summer of 1967, and on the the cover is a searing picture by uh, a wonderful com combat girl. photographer called uh, no, David Douglas Duncan. Mm. And it was of a Marine, uh, um, uh, a Marine in a, in a foxhole in the fog, looking out from the foxhole in uh, Khan Tien, Vietnam, okay. which at the time was under, uh, been under siege. Mm. And Duncan had taken some just extraordinary photographs okay. uh, mm. during his time with mm -hmm. the Marine Corps there. It was the northernmost outpost in Vietnam along mm -hmm. the demilitarized zone. And uh, I looked at that thinking, and the other, and the pictures inside Life magazine, thinking this is, wow, this is really, I mean, this is like, World War II or something. Right, I mean, this right, is really right. big time. You didn't know a fellow named Philip jo uh, Phillips Griffiths, did you? Photographer. Uh, no, he, he he did really great photography. I didn't work know early on. We didn't. We didn't. We didn't. We we, we didn't mingle with. with uh, I, I didn't. I didn't know of. Uh, no. Or you didn't know of him, or see any photograph. No, I but knew the Dun photograph had a big influence on your consciousness. Or well, it just that what you're getting at. Well, it, it was there. It was this. 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 Uh, Marine Siri. sitting in the foxhole, yeah. looking out uh, in the fog, yeah. and uh, ten days later, 
I was in the same foxhole uh -huh. with the same Marine. Yeah. In the same place at Contien on you, the DMZ. Not the same guy. The same guy. My God, that's really amazing. That's and amazing. The yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and all exactly yeah. the same place. So right. this place that two weeks earlier had looked just like alien. Geez, I could never yeah. do that. Mm -hmm. Was now um, stark uh, reality. Was stark reality. Yeah. And yeah. Um, and that. Uh, what was your began. attitude at that time? Can you and you have those letters? That's wonderful. You have those letters. You were writing them consistently back yeah. home, sending them back, and they're saved and everything. That's a really good record of that. What was your attitude toward the whole Magella, as they say? Uh, the anti-Vietnam thing was starting to really get serious, and what was your attitude toward it then? They had taught you. In the military, they teach you to kill other people, which is not a natural instinct necessarily born into the human spirit. What was your attitude toward the whole venture and so forth, if you well, could? Well, I think if you're, uh, first off, in, in being in the Marine Corps, and yeah. I think a lot of my old friends would tell you this, that, mm. that I emerged from Paris Island with a, with a somewhat different attitude about life? things. Well, not so much about life, but about duty and about okay. my duty to the Marine Corps and my my comrades in Semper arms Fi. in the Marine Corps. Semper Fi. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when I got to Vietnam, there's no time to be thinking about what was going on back home, although you could hear the, the distant drum beats. Had you read any geopolitics or anything? Had you thought about George Kennan or any of the things or the rationales by which we got there or any of that? You hadn't involved yourself in no, that. No, I mean, I knew about it, but I, you know. I, you didn't so have an much. attitude. No. Did you have an attitude to the people who were making all that trouble in the streets of America against no. what you were doing? Or that didn't affect your consciousness or those of the people around you? No. Or, okay. No, we were Marines. Okay. And, um, okay. and we, had a, we had a job. We had a duty. We were trained. Um, there was really no time for distraction. If we had a free second, which we rarely did, we, mm -hmm. we would sleep or eat or be on watch. Yeah. Um, or be on patrol, or be on ambush, or be on uh, you know, all, or laying wire, or digging holes, or filling sandbags, or, or doing what you yeah. There wasn't time yeah. uh, to be thinking about what was going on at home, although we were conscious of it. Okay. Uh, but there all wasn't, right. but we were Marines, and at any time, uh, and we were Marines and in, involved in some of the heaviest fighting of the war. Yeah, that's what I said. Um, yeah. The time that I was there were the deadliest months of, um, uh, of the entire war. Really? Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they just got, got worse uh, and worse. Uh, so it was, um, you know, I, mean, I, I formed opinions about it after I got home, but not, I never did when I was in harm's way. You couldn't, any more than a Marine could today. Or any other time. The that Marine is Corps, interesting. That's it, it's very not, interesting. Um, the job is to, uh, from the generals down um, to the privates, it is um, you've raised your hand to serve and to serve the commander in chief and to serve at his discretion with in an action with the approval of Congress if it's a mm -hmm. war. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was why we were there. You couldn't say, well, gee, I don't. You think were into it. Yeah. Well, I wasn't. I wasn't necessarily. I never volunteered to go to Vietnam. Many okay, of my friends did. Yeah, that would have been. Um, but in my heart, I sort of hoped that I might go mm -hmm. uh, because I thought it was so much a, a part of the experience that I'd been trained for. You're young, yeah. But I wasn't. Uh, I wasn't. I was naive, but I wasn't so naive as to raise my hand and say. Well, uh, if you're in the military, you never raise your hand or volunteer well, I, for no, anything. No, that was exactly. rule number one. That hadn't changed. Yes, yeah, that, yeah, yeah, right, right. So I didn't. Uh, I never. Um, uh, I volu didn't volunteer, but they, but obviously got sent. Mm -hmm. I spent um, uh, uh, then six or seven months in in Vietnam, where we had a lot of action in the beginning, and then in the middle was uh, the time of the Tet Offensive, um, Tet, yeah. and um, so it got it got busy. We had a, some terrible um, things happen all around us, but for the most part, my company remained. Uh, Charlie Company. You were in infantry. Yes. M16, M14. Uh, M16. M16. Yeah. yeah. M16, 60 mortars. Mm -hmm. um, uh, infantry. Infantry. Yeah. Marine. Yeah. You were separate from army uh, entities, or Completely. how did they? Yeah. They had a different role. Uh, they were in Marines are thought of as being uh, the leader, the tough guys. The they were in a different part of the country, yeah. um, and I mean the army had it. Um, 
you know, being a, every bit as tough as the Marine Corps in a lot of the places they were. I mean, it was no, um, but we just happened to be, at the time I was there, we occupied the northernmost tier of what was called the Northern I Corps, or mm -hmm. One Corps, mm -hmm. of, the, of South Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So the whole area along the demilitarized zone mm -hmm. between um, North and South Vietnam, right. and also the western part of South Vietnam, which mm. uh, bordered uh, Laos, um, where the a lot of the on the then called Ho Chi Minh Trail, yeah. where a lot of the arms and and men came down mm -hmm. uh, to avoid um, being in Vietnam, because yeah. the U.S. theoretically wasn't allowed to go into into Laos. Right, right, right. So that was where the Marines were. So they were really the first line of defense, if you will, against the North Vietnamese Army. Mm -hmm. The Army, um, the United States Army, in, uh, although there were some units up there, and increasingly mm -hmm. as the Marines pulled out, mm -hmm. the, the, the Army was all up there. Mm -hmm. But uh, in further south in Vietnam, from, say, Da Nang or down to Saigon and the, the Mekong Delta and whatnot, um, early on, increasingly, the what you were fighting against were um, what are, you know, the Viet Cong, VC. Okay. Yeah. So they were popular forces mm -hmm. um, that were more uh, guerrilla forces, like um, um, you know, as as yeah. you see in in uh, uh, in Afghanistan or Iraq to a great yeah, degree. Yeah, I mean, yeah. People jumped or uh, people who are in the business of just hit them where they ain't. Yeah, and, and we got a lot of people. We ended up getting about five hundred and eighty thousand American troops on the ground over there. At the height of our yeah, engagement, I was, at the height I, when I was there, it was um, uh, I can't remember what the exact number was, but it was certainly in the five hundreds. The, they yeah. reached, it reached a peak while really I was, got while I there. was there. Yeah, and yeah. Obviously, the and we suffered fifty eight thousand deaths or something yes. in that almost. 59. And there was something on the order. I don't know to what degree it was. Uh, partly, uh, the, Mr. McNamara in the end did say he thought in the fog of war it was a mistake. I don't know if you've ever contemplated that or if people that were involved in it with the, you know, that kind of thing. And then, um, you know, it, that there was something on the order of three to four million people of Southeast Asia that uh, perished in that. Do you ever, did you give thought to that at all at the time? No. Did you give thought to Jane Fonda going to North, Car North Vietnam? Did you see her as a... That happened after, or, I, got, that happened after I got back. Okay, after you, okay, I didn't mean to bring it. I just bring it up because that was what was blowing in the wind back here, you understand, yeah. I think, I mean, I... I um, um, was it a mistake? Or maybe that's not for you to say? It wasn't really for me to say. I, okay. I think that... Okay, uh, fair enough. I was glad to come home. Uh -huh. I was... Um, uh, before I got home, we that we we suffered in. Uh, I mean, during that year, just to you know continue on. I mean, in mm. that yeah, sorry. later that winter and spring, yeah. um, we got word that Martin Luther King yeah. was had been assassinated. It yeah. was uh, it was shocking. Yeah. In January of that year, mm -hmm. we got word that the Pueblo had been captured by North Korea, oh. and which was a Navy vessel with Marines on board, and uh -huh. they gave it up without a shot. Mm -hmm. uh, so increasingly, I, we, we felt like perhaps we were paper tigers, mm -hmm. um, having nothing to do with whether the, you know, what, what the, you know, the war was. But with uh, Martin Luther King's assassination, yeah. I yeah. think that um, we'd never had any race problems uh, ever, any time I was in the Marine Corps. In the Corps. Corps. Never. But, That's interesting. But isn't things it? Yeah. changed just a tiny bit that that day. Oh, uh, and, the, and, and the assassination of King, yeah, in particular. I mean, and then they, mm. after I left, I think in all the services, things mm. got um, along uh, racial legitimate. lines. You mean? Yeah. Really? Is that right? Uh, you mean it, it? It flared up, or is it, it had it, not been there? As it had in the country, I think the you know the the, the military is reflective in many ways of. Um, uh, of the country. Well, you had all that thing coming up in the Southland of this country, and you had a Voting Rights Act coming, and you had uh, Mr. Wallace standing in the door of racial uh, segregation in the South. You had a big, big civil rights thing and a general movement. It came to be called the Vietnam, or some people call it the Woodstock Nation syndrome. It was that was a time when there were some really heavy duty, big changes going on in this country and in the world. Oh, there were. Uh, you know what I mean? Incredible changes. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, at that time, there were. Um, you know, by the time I came home, right, right around the time I came home, in the summer of 1968, mm -hmm. um, um, there were 
riots in, in many of the major cities, uh, race riots in many of the major cities in the United States. Race uh, riots, yeah. Enormous um, losses, uh, enormous um, tension, racial tension that, um, that existed in this country mm -hmm. for, um, for a number of years for good, you know, I mean, in retrospect, for, you know, for obvious, obvious uh, reasons. But we never saw it much, we, we never saw it much where we were. We when were, you were like, in Vietnam, you mean? Yeah, we never saw it much. Nor were you able, as you put it, to be able to put much attention to that sort of thing. You were so damn busy doing what yeah, you had to did, do. Yeah. That kind of thing. Yeah, so you're busy and you can't pay a lot of attention to the nuances of what people are thinking, right. although you knew that it was going on. Uh, and you write so well. And Loon, maybe we can get to the title of the book, Loon, that right. was a supply center. or Could you talk about it? Because it is the title of the book. It, Loon was a, is the name of a, um, of a landing zone mm -hmm. uh, or uh, an LZ mm -hmm. that was uh, near Khe Sanh, Vietnam, in the northwest corner of South Vietnam, okay. in uh, an area that looks um, a lot like, like New Hampshire, or New England. Okay. Um, it's hilly uh, and uh -huh. uh, very lovely, beautiful yeah. area, and it's also right where. Um, the Ho Chi Minh Trail came in, okay. where a lot of the supplies came in. Yeah. And up until that point, up until May of 1968 now, mm -hmm. uh, Marines had still either been, had been fairly stationary at places like Khe Sanh or, um, which had recently been under siege, or Khan Tien before that, and had not been active doing what Marines do, which is going out and finding the bad guys and, and killing them. So um, that changed in May, and we became the tip of the spear of uh, one of the first groups to go out and start landing on these hilltops in northwestern Viet South Vietnam, mm -hmm. um, and to go in with a, a company or two companies or even a battalion of Marines, um, land, secure it, uh, the next day bring in uh, artillery, 105 uh, howitzers. I know how to fire a 105 And then howitzer. blow the, you know, the bejesus out of the area, patrol it, get everybody sort of on the run, and then after three or four days, pick the whole schmear up, and then and go, do it, on and, and go do it someplace Didn't else. Didn't have anything to do with strategic Hamlet notion and everything? That we no, that was, all, that was all the southern uh, stuff. Okay, okay. Uh, you know, where there, I mean, this was, where we were, there were no civilians. Oh, I mean, really? the civilians were long gone. It's a different proposition. And most of the area was, uh, had been, while, while I was there, was mm -hmm. heavily defoliated with Agent Orange. Agent Orange played havoc on that country. Sure. Oh still does. That dioxin? Still does. That's a thing that ought to still be addressed by us, I think, don't you? Yes. Well, yeah. it's, I mean, it's addressed for, they've, they've uh, um, I mean, the Veterans Administration has addressed it for, for, us. for those of us that serve. But, but what the, about the folks that are there? But the, the millions of people that were affected in uh, South Vietnam. Horrible. That it, was, you know, it was in the water and the ground. For me, it's, uh, I mean, I have... Uh, uh, the guy I, Griffiths that I mentioned to you, the photographer, you want to look it up. I'll send you a link after we're okay. done and everything. But he was a major photographer, and he came out with a major book on the effects of Agent Orange on the people of Vietnam. He was a photojournalist, one of the earliest ones who started along at that time when they were so taking tracking it. it. Well, tracking it and also, uh, you know, beginning to lay the groundwork for our, in the end, getting out of there. Well, I have a, um, I mean, I carry a combat disability from my exposure to Agent Orange. You do, yeah, okay. So it's, uh -huh. um, which is, uh, the bad news, the good news is, thank God, uh, it never impacted my my children, um, mm -hmm. any offspring. Yeah, it does. That, it can, which it yeah. can. Uh, yeah. And the impact that it had on. Now, I was there for a little less than a year. Uh -huh. So imagine um, it, you know, being born there and living there for the next twenty years uh -huh. after we were gone, mm -hmm. uh, and having it in the water, in the soil, yeah, right. in everything. Yeah. Uh, it was just, um, and what it, and, and it manifested itself. Hideously, with yeah. birth defects, with um, uh, just the most awful yeah. um, stuff. Well, the whole thing, war is hell and everything, but when you're in the middle of fighting it, you don't have a lot of time to think about those things. No. You can't if say, you're a Marine. excuse me. <laughs> yeah, to stop, the, stop the film, I yeah. want to get off. So you know, we landed, we landed on, on what was LZ Loon, um, and a uh, beautiful day, and um, we after we'd been there about a day, we started to get, have um, 
the North Vietnamese uh, shoot rockets over us, big rockets and artillery from a place in Laos 12 miles away okay. called Ko Rock. Uh -huh. It was the same place that, that the guns had been that hit Khe Sanh. Oh, wow. And they were dug into mountains and they were in Laos, so they were almost impossible for us to get at. Um, and they were shooting rockets. Rockets. Not artillery. Shooting. Rockets and artillery. Okay, yeah. Probably 155 artillery and. 155, uh, big guns. And 160 millimeter rockets. That's a, lot of, that's a lot of firepower. They had to bring it down through the. How in the hell did they get they it did. there? And the supply lines and all of that is something. No, how did they get 155s and through a jungle pathway or something? Well, you know, it's they, hard to fathom. People are carrying them. I mean, yeah, I mean I it's, just, so. just, yeah. it, it's just a. Um, and pulling them. And yeah. every night B 52s are bombing them. Yeah. Um, and they still have them. So they, the first day they sent a couple that went over us. Now this is 12 miles away trying to hit a top of the hill is probably half the size of, um, uh, you know, of the, of, of this building. I mean, mm -hmm. it's not a big, wasn't a big space. Yeah. And so they go flying over and they'd land like a mile away because they just miss. And then finally they, they got it figured out. Um, and they started hitting the hill, and mm -hmm. they started hitting... Actual loon, you mean? Actually, on loon, mm -hmm. and they started hitting our holes. That's hitting you with what now again? With, um, with rockets and with artillery. 105? Uh, no, probably 155. For I see that as a big gun, Port Sill. I mean, twelve miles. Yeah, yeah, that's a big gun. Yeah, yeah. 105. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it could. You know, 105 I, I, is a little more. Uh, they didn't. They didn't. You know, that was my MOS 105. I know how to okay. fire a 105, they, they and I know how to drive an M48 tank, <laughs> as I said. Well, thankfully, we didn't have to f come up against any of those. Any but, of the tanks. Okay. And, and yeah. nor, nor did they share with us what they were shooting. Right. Uh, we okay. Just, right. We no, just, I understand. You're just intuitive. We just knew when they came in. You're but, writing home this journal. You're able to among the things. You're you're in heavy duty uh, combat. I'm not I, writing home while I'm. No, I'm thinking you can't. You'd have to do it in retrospect. No, but we, you know what we I'm were saying. we were on there for our lives, and we had yeah right. Uh, the first First day, um, yeah. the first day, uh, eight or ten boys were killed. Wow. Um, okay. And we then that night um, mm -hmm. we couldn't stay on the hill because if we and then we were surrounded completely. Mm -hmm. We knew um, outgunned, out, outmanned, and, uh, and it turned out we'd landed on top of what was probably a regimental headquarters. Uh -huh, uh -huh. They were all dug in underneath us. Wow. Um, so that night, our uh, company commander, Bill Negron, who um, Receive a silver star for his actions mm -hmm. on Loon, uh, moved us to an adjacent hill. Uh, once the uh, dark came, we took everything we could carry, which was leaving a How lot of How many of you were there? When we went in, there were Did probably you say about it was a, a platoon. I mean, not a platoon. No, there were I two, mean, a, a two companies. Charlie two and, companies. Charlie yeah. and Delta Company of mm -hmm. the First Battalion, Fourth Marines. Okay, and that's a what's that? A couple hundred men? Yeah, they were. Well, we were all in their staff, so maybe each one when we went in had. You know, 150, 140 guys. Yeah. There were about 150 okay. guys in Charlie Company. Right, right. And um, we lost uh, um, probably, you know, 10 dead, maybe 30 wounded the first day. Wow. Um, we weren't able to get the dead out. We did get the wounded out. The Good next God. day, we, or that night, we moved to the next hill because yeah. you know from artillery that yeah. it would take. Um, after the sun came up, it yeah. would take them a while to adjust their fire right, from one right. hill to the next. Right, right. And we figured during that period, we might be able to get some helicopters in to get us out of there. Yeah. We were obviously not in a good You place. were getting support from behind? Uh, we, Adequate support to support your effort from? Uh, well, we had before the, before the, uh, the, the barrage the started, barrage, yeah, but nobody right, right. was coming in when that was going right. on. Right, okay, yeah, okay, yeah. And then, uh, so the next day, we, mm. we woke up on this adjacent hill having left are dead, having left a lot of our ammo, everything. Didn't over have to leave any wounded, that we could you? No. Okay. Uh, and then that day, the, the last day we were on Loon, June 6th, uh, 1968, we were uh, effectively overrun. So they, wow. uh, they penetrated our, we were surrounded, they penetrated our lines. Um, we didn't get hit with the artillery anymore. Mm, well, but they, they um, uh, Was it hand to hand? It was uh, on, on Long Delta Company lines, it was hand to hand. They Good broke God. through the lines. How horrible. Um, we had, um, we called in uh, our own um, uh, artillery on us to explode over us. Wow. Um, and uh, because we were intermingled with in many places along the lines, we were intermingled with North Vietnamese regulars. Right. 
So we got the word, you know, when to get down when when the when the artillery was coming and it came in as air bursts. And they would do it in air, okay. And yeah. it would air, so it would all explode like above this ceiling. And they were that close to where that was effective to attack them. And it get them all. Wow. And uh, without getting us, because yeah. we would know to be in, you know, be in the holes. You'd get some shrapnel. That's in a your, pretty careful piece of choreography. It, it gets, it, well, it was but good that, thing you would better have good radio. Connection. And then we had close. Yes, mm. we had very good uh, radio communications mm. and uh, very talented people. In um, um, you know, we, Bill Negron was a was a brilliant commander and and had good sergeants and good um, um, all marine. But yeah, all marine. Yeah. And we had a. Um, They've got that reputation of being really good at. What well, they when do. they when the time came, yeah. uh, everybody did their job, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. they did it. They did it well, and because they did, we're. Um, uh, I'm here. The um, uh, we got close air support from helicopter gunships from mm -hmm. uh, Phantom jets dropped napalm, mm -hmm. dropped high napalm explosives. Napalm was so horrible. They were dropping napalm within. 50 yards of us. Good grief. Um, that's how close everything was. Mm -hmm. uh, and by the end of the day, then they, they were able to get, uh, at about 3 in the afternoon, they were able to get a, one helicopter in during a little bit of a lull to get some a part of the company that was isolated, mm -hmm. had become isolated. And they got them out. Mm -hmm. And then the helicopter got about part way up, and it was shot down. Mm -hmm. um, now we're on top of a hill, so it, you know, it, it went down, exploded, and and rolled down the hill, and that killed um, um, 18 boys. Then 17, uh, two or three survived, or maybe four. Um, that was when we all stood up and sung the Marine Corps hymn. Really? So they would uh, to let them know where. Well, as a screw you to the enemy, but also to let, we knew that the people who had survived the crash, if there were any, would be very disoriented because they were they'd gone, they were down the jungle, in the bottom of the hill. Mm -hmm. um, and so we wanted to let them know where we were and right. where safety was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we were able to, to get them, to find them, um, and, uh, and get them up with us. And then at the, by the end of the day, when um, at nightfall we were going to leave the hill, uh, and just head off north mm -hmm. in groups of three to um, uh, and just what they call E and E escape and evade uh, uh, in little groups of three on the theory that we'd you know some wouldn't make it some out way. of the original way you said two, 150, 200, how many how many were uh, how many uh, survived if that's right you're one uh, mm -hmm. one yeah, yeah. Uh, Bill Negron's mm -hmm. one yeah yeah um, from Charlie Company. Um, well, uh, five helicopters worth. So, mm -hmm. well, there's helicopters, 30, big helicopters, 60, small. Yeah, so it would probably be maybe sixty guys. Sixty guys killed or not? No, left survived. out of out of the whole two and the rest, companies. And the rest were killed and wounded. Boy, oh boy, that's a heavy to toll. Yeah. On your side, did they have tolls like that on the other side? With the to with they their they didn't they didn't keep us in the loop. No, <laughs> no. They said that we killed. Um, but when we got out, uh, because we had to, we got out so quickly at the end of that last day, uh, we were not able to take out any of our dead. Okay. Um, so we left. Um, well, but again, you could take all wounded. All the wounded got out. Yeah. And a lot yeah. of the wounded were able to get out on, on on yeah on on a, on a couple on some medevacs during the yeah. battle, okay. where smaller helicopters were able to get right, out. Right. 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 Um, so we went back a week later. Mm. Um, back to Loon? Back to Loon mm -hmm. to recover our dead. Ah, uh, really? Okay. And um, so they prepped the mountain, they dropped us in under a big smoke screen. And so we got to see the, the, uh, the, the battlefield, yeah, the right. carnage. Yeah, and yeah. Um, there were... Um, there were bodies about? So? Well, there were... You know, there were thirty body parts. There were thirty six of us mm -hmm. um, that that we had to pick up and put in bags. The mm -hmm. guy we had to peel the guys out of the helicopter um, that you know which had Crash, which had yeah. burned badly. Yeah. Um, there were um, uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of North Vietnamese soldiers everywhere um, that were that were burned that you know suffered from the napalm um, that were. Um, um, and we left. Uh, we left them for for them to take. We took. We took ours. We put them in a, um, you know, in a big 
cargo and put them in bags and put them in a car. There's a, a picture at the beginning of Loon of yeah. us uh -huh. carrying one of the bodies up yeah. to the to the um, to the landing zone that was right. taken by an yeah. AP photographer who mm -hmm. was with us. Uh -huh. And that was that was Loon, and that was the centerpiece of, uh, of not just my experience, yeah. but the experience of most of the fellows that I that I served with. I went home. That was June sixth. We found out not for five or six days that um, coincident to June 6th also it was a day that... Bobby June 6th is uh, D-Day. Oh, it was D-Day. Mm, uh, it happens, right? But June 6th, 1968 yes. was the day Bobby Kennedy was shot. Oh, no, really? So Isn't that uh, amazing? I was in California and I remember it. So that was, it was really a... So for the next two months that I was in Vietnam, mm -hmm. it was, we were in the hills, it was summer, it was hot. We were doing continually landing on hills, bringing in artillery, um, uh, then going on patrols into the jungle, suffering losses, um, uh, very, very heavy, arduous um, um, uh, fighting and service fe under very, very tough um, circumstances. And then one day in early August, uh, the supply helicopter came in and uh, Dropped off food, dropped off mail, and picked me up to send me home. <laughs> Take you home, yeah. Not the whole unit. Or... No, in Vietnam, you uh, everybody came alone, and they pretty much went home alone. I don't understand a, why would that be. That it was they just would... a unique thing about that war. Um, so when I was the only one to leave that day, and maybe two new guys came in, you know. Um, but there was no cohesion in the unit. So. What was it? What, what, why did it happen that way? It must have happened from decisions made at a higher level or something. Why would they be doing something like that? Well, it that? wasn't my idea. <laughs> no, 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 but you were glad that you were picked. But I'm saying, no. what would have caused them to start? Oh, I think it's just the way they, the, the way, thinking, you know. Luck of the draw? The, would no, it just, have been just, a, just the way they did it. I think that when the Marines first went over in 1965 and landed in uh, Chulai, they they came over as a unit, mm -hmm. and after that, they just rolling have rolling replacements. Yeah, and uh, war is a very chaotic thing. Well, uh, yeah. it is that. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> mm. So they, um, so when I went home, I mean, I went from I took a helicopter back to Dong Ha, which was our rear area, mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, you know got checked out, and a day or two later took a. Um, a plane down to uh, maybe another helicopter down to Da Nang, which mm -hmm. was the big, yeah, biggest big. base in um, northern part of Vietnam, mm -hmm. and then got processed. And then a day or two later, took a Pan Am jet to first to Okinawa for a day, and mm -hmm. then uh, where there's a big Marine presence, and then home to Travis Air Force Base. Mm -hmm. So I arrived at Travis Air Force Base on a plane of however many people would be on a Boeing 707, let's mm -hmm. say like 200 kids. Yeah. Air Force, Army, Navy, Oh, they're all Coast coming Guard. from, they were all coming? Oh, yeah. It I, wasn't a regular flight. It I didn't was a, know. a military No, they're all, it's all military um, and personnel. Uh, charters. Yeah. But there was nobody that I'd served with. There was nobody oh. that was, you know, even in my battalion that, yeah. that was there. 550,000 is a lot of people. And then when... Yeah. But, but we all came over just sort of by ourselves, and we all returned just like as, yeah. as single people. Uh -huh. um, oh, that's interesting. So when I got home, I landed at Travis Air Force Base uh, in California, and my sister lived in San Francisco, which mm. was uh, about an hour away. Uh, and I called her. Uh, I was going to She didn't know you were coming. No, nobody knew. Um, and... Uh, You'd, I was going to get discharged. Had you been able to write letters home to your family that had anything to do with Loon or anything sure. like that or no, anything? I, nothing was censored. I, I, yeah, I wrote. No, but what, did you have the time and the state of mind or whatever that made it possible for you to make a record of that yeah. as it was going on? That's very good. Yeah. But I, you know, but it was all with. Mm. It was also with. Uh, um, I mean, I sugar coated an awful lot. But sugar coated. Well, for my parents, you know, I didn't want them to be. Right. No, I understand. You know, yeah. be concerned mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the picture that is in the beginning of the yeah. book appeared on the front page of the New York Times. Did it really? Yeah. And Let's see if I can get it. My, Go ahead. My mother uh, mm -hmm. uh, cut it out and sent it to me and said, gee, this sounds like your description of, 
you know, of your group. Uh -huh. um, and is this the one you mean? Yeah, that's the one. So well, I'll hold this up. If you can bring it in, maybe you can see. This is a picture, a little grayed out. This is a picture that was uh, there that he's referring to. Yeah, it's hard to see, but this is a... Um, Let me see. You, you can see a... Um, there we go. Uh, you better come out a little yeah. bit there. Come out a little bit. Or I'll come back. Okay, there we well, go. Well, that's a it's a flag we took from Tom Morrissey, who was our machine gunner who was killed on Loon. Uh -huh. He always kept it in his pocket, and we mm -hmm. recovered it, found his stick. That looks a little bit like the thing on Iwo Jima. And then, on, probably, you know, the yeah. famous photo. Yeah. yeah. And then on the left, you can see uh, three Marines carrying a uh, a plastic body bag mm -hmm. with they just bringing up one of the dead from the uh, from the helicopter. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting to me personally about that picture is that it's right. Uh, that spot right at the sort of at the base of it is where my hole was um, Your during hole the hole that you had seen on the, the plane as you flew over there during no well, no that was well, this was, was a very different, different plane yeah, this right. was during the artillery um, mm -hmm. uh, attack on the on the 5th of June mm -hmm. um, but it was we had one photographer came with us and he um, we'd never had press with us ever but they took that shot mm -hmm. um, and it was uh, Made the cover of Time, uh, Time uh, New York Times. It, it was in, it made the it was on the front page of uh, of the New York Times. It was also in Time magazine. Oh um, right, right. So it was it was. Uh, um, uh, but my um, you know when I when I got home, I was getting I was going to get discharged because I was going to start college in a couple of weeks. Oh, that's right. So you, you had that thing, there was the two-year deal. There was a Navy base at Treasure Island on yeah, there is, yeah. Uh, was, San Francisco. Yeah. So that was where I was going to get out processed. Yeah. So I waited for my, so I sat alone on a curb at Travis Air Force Base waiting for my sister to drive, and brother, to drive from San Francisco out to pick me up. Everybody else got on buses and went to other flights or other places that they were all all going scattered to the wind. And you had to be mustered out yet. You were still. Like, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So they came and picked me up. So now I'm alone for the first time in almost a year, mm -hmm. just sitting on that curb. Sitting on a curb. What was going on in your head? Seven what? in the morning. Yeah. Seven in the morning, California time. And what were you thinking about? And what's How going on? How quiet it was. Why it was. Quiet. It was. Quiet. It was just silent. Um, the, and it made me realize how just the constant 24-hour noise of being in a battle or a battle zone. There's always uh, uh, artillery going in and out. There's always planes flying overhead. There's always helicopters overhead. There's always something going on. There's just act, action, uh, activity, even if it's not battle. And then to be in a place that was completely silent you hadn't had moments when it was silent when you between you're not always fighting directly there's not always that I mean there must be moments of lull in well, the, in in the in the context of a battle situation there's always right. ambient noise um, all right okay that's interesting you know, it's yeah like, like my the, the I, whir of war huh? Some, yeah. Yeah. I mean war. there's always uh, yeah. um, equipment clanging there's, yeah right. there's always helicopters overhead there's yeah. always uh, uh, people shooting off Mortars, you know, going out, and a lot of it's out, outgoing. We've only got about five minutes left now, right, to the program here. So I wonder, you're sitting there in California, and I know you were destined to go and become enter Harvard, uh, you know, and so forth. After all of this experience, what were your thoughts? What are your thoughts on your experience at Loon and on the uh, the thing that you were so engaged in that you've written about in retrospect? Uh, good question, Harold. The um uh, in retrospect, I, I buried the whole experience. I got back, um, arrived at Harvard two weeks later. The campus was uh, not literally on fire, but it was certainly... Uh, we closed every... In 1970, they closed every university across the country almost. Yeah, that was it. Yeah, it was... It was a year later. It makes Egypt look like a, uh, you know, a, a police state compared to... You know what I'm saying? Well, Egypt cu currently, you know. The... Uh, there was a big uprising. It was uh, it, it was not a good time to be a Vietnam veteran. I would have the thought States. they were spat upon, and and they were. Well, I was no, never I was never spat upon. No, but, but you understand what I'm saying psychologically in no, that. In, in my case, called baby killers yeah, and well, all that. But that always comes. But you understand what I'm saying. Yeah, but I think it's important for people to know that yeah. that really the um, unlike today the attitude was one of um, uh, really just in, in my case certainly just ambivalence. 
ambivalence toward the whole bit. Yeah, so I was in the Marine Corps while well, that's in Vietnam, and people for the most part just didn't understand how, or what that was, how it could have been, what somebody like me had been doing it. And then what I found was that mo it was true with most of my friends, even the ones that had come from Iowa farm towns or Louisiana or Texas or um, any place, that they uh, really, basically, people didn't care. Oh, people didn't care about? About their service. They didn't care the way they'd cared about, say, veterans of World War II. They, they, weren't, they weren't honored. There were no parades. There was no... I think World War II was the last time that they were universally honored in yeah, having people, defeated fascism ever since Vietnam. Well, people just... And there I mean, today is, today is very different. I don't think there's a... There's probably hardly a person in the United States today, I don't think, and this is, this is a very good thing, that doesn't think that we don't have the best military in terms of the way it's trained, in terms of how they execute what they're executing, uh, how they carry out their jobs, regardless of what you may think of the wars. Um, and um, I think that the, the wounded coming home uh, and the veterans coming home to a great degree uh, have, if nothing else, a large degree of respect. And Vietnam veterans really had none. It was really quite. Oh the, no, I know there wasn't was any. Really there was, quite there was the, animosity. It was quite the opposite. Yeah. And it took. And if I may, the people, political leadership, uh, political leadership of this country have, uh, particularly people, you know, uh, they want to get. We're going to lick the Vietnam syndrome because yeah. it was an example of the United States of America, the superpower of the world, was defeated. Yeah. And we lost a war. We're used to winning wars. We won the war against all the Indian nations, that sort of thing. We were powerful and we were standing up and we have that kind of an attitude. We weren't used to losing. Well, we lost for, the war. I think the, for the it, was, it was a mistake on our part. Yeah. We had to admit that we don't want to do that and we want to think America stands strong and tall. Yeah, I talk about that mm -hmm. in the in the yeah. book in what I call my last letter uh, which was well, written I got a minute left, so seven or eight um, years later mm -hmm. but I think that um, for me I buried it for about 25 years. I would have thought yeah. I mean really buried it. Yeah, okay, and, hear you. Uh, never talked to anybody, had no contact with anybody I'd served with and then it just started bubbling up because you can't keep these things down mm -hmm. and I found uh, Bill Negron, my old company commander, yeah. and it turned out he had been in contact with nobody. Okay. And so now, after all these years, I started to write to tell our story. And that's what you did here, and you're going to meet with him tonight, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, or is that true? Not with him, but I'm going to meet with some other, some of the other people scallywags. And, and yeah. the scallywags <laughs> that did it, and it's good to bring it out, because you're coming from a different perspective. It's absolutely riveting, the writing, and it has got great good humor and everything like that. I congratulate you enormously. Thank you on the book. I do. Please give my best to Stephen, oh, Eric I've Broner, a mutual friend of ours. Certainly will. And uh, in the audience, well, welcome very much. The book couldn't be more recommended, Loon, a marine story. And it's here. Our author is uh, Jack McLean. And it's a really interesting story. And it's very, very gripping. You can't put it down. So one is and all is uh, encouraged to get the book.